Well, good morning. Glad you could be with us here today as we study more of God's Word. As we try to grow closer to Him as we go through our lives. This morning's sermon title, The Best Gift Giver. Do you ever think about that? And no, it's not Santa Claus. Just to let you know, you don't have to worry about it the rest of the sermon. It's that time again, though. Or in fact, for most of us, time is over. We've got many shopping le minutes left before the big day tomorrow, right? Some people love to shop. Some people love to buy. Some people love to get a gift. So what's the problem? It all sounds pretty wonderful, right? The vast majority of us aren't that good at any of them. You've all received a gift that you went, oh, thank you very much wasn't exactly what you were looking for, okay? What do you want for Christmas is something we might hear. And how many times does the reply come back something like this? Well, I don't know. Big help. Big help. Okay? Or perhaps you might have someone in your family who is able to do this. I want an official Red Rider Carbine Action 200 shot range model air rifle. And you all know where that's from, Christmas story. And we all know the next line, right? You'll shoot your eye out. <laughs> of course, we know Ralphie knew his want. He thought he knew his need. Just like any kid, like a lot of adults, we think we know what we want, what our needs are, okay? There are, or at least used to be, assistant shoppers in many retail stores. Oh, you probably wouldn't find them at Woolworths. Or you probably wouldn't have found them at Ben Franklin's, but the finer stores, which in code means the expensive stores, would have had these assistant shoppers. And you'd go up there just hanging your head, help me, help me. So I gotta buy a present for my fill in the blank and I don't know what to do. And so the assistant shopper would take you on a magical journey, showing you all the gifts that could fit the bill for anyone. So my question is, if they're so smart, why did I wind up with only three new tires one Christmas morning? <laughs> you know, you need four. Just kidding, never happened, but you get the idea. They're shopping for you, or you're shopping for somebody, doesn't always work. All this talk of gifting comes under the headings of wants and needs. It's a big difference between the two. My guess is if we ask 50 people on the street today about something to fulfill their needs as a gift, 50 people, just man on the street kind of questions, what would fulfill your needs as a gift? I doubt any of them would say salvation. They would have all sorts of other things. New tires, you know, just right on down the line. If you had a new electric car, you'd want, of course, a battery for Christmas, because by now your battery is out. Okay, oops, sorry. Um, the problem is we are so wrapped up in wants and desires, we rarely see our needs. I was just looking at a song in the book that says, Oh, He Knows Just What I Need is the title of it. And it's written, of course, from a perspective of someone who is a Christian following God, okay, or trying to. And all the needs in there are things that we consider secondary. They're important. But what is our pure need? Sal salvation. Salvation. To go through life with everything and not have salvation? Oh, how terrible. How sad. Okay? Jesus kind of reminds us of this on the Sermon on the Mount. So many were obsessed with food and clothes, they forgot about life and their body. Jesus reminds us that our needs are well known by the Heavenly Father. It tells us to seek first the kingdom and all those other things necessary for life, but not of prime importance, will be given to us. He reminds us we have a father looking out for us not to run after things like that. Secondary type things, because that's what the pagans do. So we're the same. God has the ability to know our needs long before we figure it out for ourselves. That's God. He knows what we need. You look back in scripture and go back to the beginning of uh, Genesis, and here's where it all started. This is after the um, curses 
were laid on Satan, as well as man and woman. And he talks to Satan here, God says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Jesus is the subject in here, okay? Um, between your offspring and hers, her offspring, of course, being Jesus. And Jesus will crush Satan's head. In other words, Jesus is going to take him out. Following Jesus, Satan can't touch you if you're following Jesus, okay? And you will strike his heel. He's delivering you a death blow. All you can do is put a cut in his heel. Obviously, it wasn't just. It hurt. Crucifixion was nothing to you know, make fun of. Jesus went through a lot for us. Maybe that's not perfectly clear yet, so let's go a little further. Talking about who we're talking about? In Revelation 13. We're talking about the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. When you talk about having a need, the next thing you have to talk about is having a solution, having something supplied to fulfill that need. So we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. There are many verses similar to this one, <clears throat> which talk of the coming of Jesus, that great gift. See, God is a planner. How many of you go to a store and you know exactly what you want? You got a list and you just stick to that list and you're out of there in six minutes. Okay, how many women do that? <laughs> you know, Jay says she goes right in and gets it. That's what I do when I go grocery shopping. You know, I don't even stop at the cookies very long. That's hard to believe, I know. Okay? Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of, of our faith. His plan, his gift, is called that. The author and finisher of our faith. If you're the author of a book, who wrote the book? You. You did. Okay? And when it's all over, did you write the last chapter? Yeah. You're the author and finisher. Well, in a much, much higher level, spiritual level, level, God is the author of our salvation. He thought it up. He wrote it down for us. He demonstrated it. Finished it. It's done. All we got to do is follow it. From A to Z, God has it all planned out. Let's look at a few verses that would show it this to us. In Galatians 4.4, famous verse. But when the time had fully come, God sent a son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Well, if you think this verse refers to the time God appointed for Mary to have, uh, give birth to Jesus, you are correct. Okay, that's obvious. But there's more to this. All right. He was, <clears throat> excuse me. He was born under the law like us, and as we read in other scriptures, he fulfilled that law, allowing us to be redeemed so that we might be adopted as sons. We're as children of God. As children of God. God in action, his compassion, his understanding of our true need. He loves his creation. Now, when you look at the Bible, and you look at the things mankind has done, and you can just keep writing the Bible for that portion of it that we have not improved very much as, a, as man okay we still just make blunders all the time God still loves his creation he wants to help them his plan to help them is all his idea but sometimes sometimes we stick our noses in where we shouldn't be sticking our noses in God's plan has been tampered, adjusted, changed by man for one reason. And that is our wants. I want that. I want to fill in the blank. So I will change. Example. Um, it's our wants, not needs. We fall to temptation. We sin. Because of those. But instead of recall coiling from sin, Instead of repenting of sin, instead of recognizing how wrong it is, we begin a protest movement. We get enough signatures. 
We put pressure on religious leaders. We get the government to step in, and voila, the needs as I see them, what they really want, are met. You can look up your history of the United States of America and just look at how we just kept changing and changing and changing. And a lot of times, not for the best. Not for the best. We've now taken any kind of, uh, I'll just call it religious teaching, okay? And now we take it to a Congress and say, what do you think about this, guys and girls? Oh, that doesn't sound very nice. You can't do that anymore. That's what we're getting to. Okay, we have set Congress up as our God at times. That's scary. That's dangerous, okay? But we think our needs are met when this happens. There's joy in the streets, jumping up and down. I don't know what's going on in heaven when those things happen. See, God chose a time that was perfect for sending Jesus, but even we disagree. We feel he should have been chosen, he should have been sent and chosen for our time because of how advanced we were. Some of you may remember the early 70s. Um, maybe two or three of you in here were old enough like me to remember this. It was the rock play opera called Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay, see nobody wrecked their head, so I'm right. Two or three of you might remember this. But there's one scene in there where Judas, misunderstood Judas, sings a song, and the, the title, um, let's see if I can get the verses right. Why'd you come today, let's see. Why'd you come today? If you come today, you would have reached a whole nation. Because Israel in 4 BC had no mass communication. So the logic from, from our point of view is, we got TV, we got cameras, we got satellites, we got tapes, we got everything. Well, why wouldn't you come in the 1970s or 80s? Well, God, it's his plan, chose the right time and the right place. He said, this is the time. This is what I'm going to do. Here's some of the things that went on. So that Jesus, when he came, it was the right time and the right place. Historically, the Jews were spread out from Israel. This is called the diaspora. And these Jews would relocate in distant places, but would continue to follow God's law. Um, they believe in scripture, they believe in one God, and they believed in a Messiah coming. That gift was coming from God. They also built synagogues for their worship, something the Apostle Paul made great use of in his journeys when he was teaching about Jesus. The Greek language spread due to Alexander the Great's conquest. Greek was almost the universal language. Before there was Rome, there was Greece. He, they say he'd almost conquered the entire world. Alexander the Great. And speaking of how you can get everything and gain nothing, if I recall, he died at the age of 32. Yeah, he gained it all, didn't he? Rome itself was organized, had a postal system, it had roads, it had the seaways organized and safe. And finally in Rome at that time, there was peace. It was a good time. Send his son. That's the time God decided to send him. It helped, all these helped to introduce and spread the gospel like wildfire. The things were right, as the verse says, when the time had fully come, all things just formed together. Something to keep in mind. So we move along and we look at the next thing. This is a, a verse that we're all very familiar with. If you haven't heard Linus, read it from the, the uh, Peanuts characters, you should rent the movie and so, because Linus does such a great job when he reads this, okay? Um, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. We read that and we just get chills. How wonderful, how wonderful. That's how God prepared to send his son. And were there a lot of cameras there to record the event? Did News 15 have a chopper flying around the manger? No, quiet. God used a star to let folks, some folks know, hey, something important over here. And they went to see. 
and went to see. An angel appears to the shepherds. The glory of the Lord shone around them. And others might even say that the angel stood next to them. But the point is, great fear overtook them. Overtook them. It scared them. Think about it. You're out in the middle of the country. You've been out there all your life. You're just tending to your sheep, making sure the wolves don't get them. It's a quiet night. You're about ready to fall asleep, probably, which you shouldn't do. Boom. Startled? I think so. We all would have shook. That would have happened to us. Just, Whoa, what's going on? Okay. And then you, re you remember verses like Proverbs 9 and 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. <clears throat> this was the beginning. As they were fearful, they were about to learn some wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The angels was going to lay some information on them that was wonderful news. News that they could understand to a point and use and go forward with. Okay? Um, he says, I bring you good news. They did not need to fear. And the angel tried to calm them down by telling them he had good news. I'll give you a little story here. Years ago, when I was working for one of my companies, not my company, but um, it was decided there was going to be a reorganization of the sales force, which is code word for we're firing a bunch of people. Okay? They chose seven cities across the country and split us up to send a group to each one. So we kind of thought, hey, what's going on? So, you know, as good salespeople do, we immediately tried to find out what was going on. Everybody's calling each other, asking questions, things like that. And I can tell you where I figured it all out. Pat, you're going to love this, and Russ is going to love this. I was sitting at Tiger Stadium, way off in the right field corner, all by myself, because I just wanted to be alone and think. And what a place to come and figure it all out, what was going to happen in two days. I nailed it 100%. Not that it matters, but I knew. And so, we all went to our places, Chicago, New York, Florida, whatever it may have been, they assigned to you. You could have lived in Michigan and they would have sent you to California, it didn't matter. Because it wasn't just splitting things up, it was split up for a purpose. Okay? Um, so, we're all there at 10 o'clock in Chicago, my group anyway, and the other people in their group. And at 10 a.m., a video comes on that at all seven sites at the same time. We all watch at the same time, and the president explained the reasons for the organization and how many people would be let go. Fear, anticipation, what's going to happen next? No reason to fear with God. But there was fear then. As I looked around, I saw some people in tears. They were frightened. I'm losing my job? Yeah. Maybe. These were good people. As I looked around the room, there's people I recognized, and the jobs they were doing, and how I'd heard things about them. I said, this doesn't make sense. These are good folks. What's going on? Okay? But then there came the clincher. The president, the guy who made the video, for lack of a better term, did like the Wizard of Oz, and he stepped out behind the curtain, and there he was. And then I knew. The president's not going to come to a place where people are losing their jobs. He sends his underlings for that. People in Chicago still had a job, and that's what he explained to us, okay? Um, it's a place, a place to be. He would talk to us live, and the reason why is because he had good news for us. God had good news for us when he sent the angel to tell the shepherds what was going to happen. He had wonderful news. Nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Okay? Unfortunately for those other people, they went to other cities because they all lost their job and it was horrible that day. Just to finish up the story. Okay? God sent that angel. And an angel means messenger. He had a message from God. In fact, the angel, using the strict interpretation of the Greek, says, I evangelize to you a great joy. Where you look at it, it says, I preach to you a great joy. What was the great joy? Jesus. Great joy. Great joy. 
There's always great joy in a baby being born, wonderful joy. But as happy as the shepherds might have been for the mom and dad, I doubt they hit the great joy button over this. Certainly, the announcement of the baby's birth by an angel had them curious, but it was the news he brought about the baby that should have caused great joy. Okay? So the shepherds went to see Bethlehem awaited, and they saw the baby. And when they did, they went out and spread the word concerning what they had been told and had seen, already starting things up. People who heard them were amazed, wondered, marveled. This was no ordinary child. That's what the news was all about. For all people, a blessing on the world that was going to be available to all. So I asked the question, what kind of gift giver is this? Who wrote a letter to God and said, please send somebody to save us and send us to heaven? Don't think so. God knew the needs of this world. He was taking care of them. Even though Jesus' earthly public ministry was about 30 years away, 30 years away, people were already excited about it. In fact, some had been waiting maybe all their lives or most of their lives for this day to occur. In Luke 2, 25, 35, we read the account of a man named Simeon. It's sometimes assumed he was a rabbi, but that may not have been so. He does appear to be the one who would circumcise Jesus as Mary and Joseph bought, brought Jesus to uh, the temple. Um, as the Bible says, to be done to him what should be done, which is probably circumcision for a boy, okay? Um, he was righteous and devout, and the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. And as scripture says, um, saw the consolation of Israel. Well, when I read that at first, I said, consolation, consolation. Where have I heard that word before? TV, game shows. Oh, Tim, we're sorry you didn't win today, but we have a nice consolation prize for you. That doesn't sound really good, does it? Well, once again, we've taken a word that was meant to be something special and really dwindled it down to mean nothing. Somebody else got the big prize, you get the consolation prize. Sorry. The big gift of God was Jesus. And the wonderful thing about it was everybody could win. Everybody could win. Promised through Scripture and now delivered. The consolation of Israel was the consoling of Israel. It was the deliverance of comfort. Jesus was that comfort. This is what Jesus was, and Simeon had been promised he would not die before he saw that. And his words were, after he saw Jesus, he talked to Mary and Joseph for a minute, he said, I'm ready to die, Lord. Take me now. That's all he was waiting for. God promised he would live. I don't know how many years he lived from the conversation with God. But as soon as he, he saw Jesus, he said, I'm ready. Take your servant now. Anna was also there, a prophetess. Uh, there's not seemed to be a very big backstory of the Holy Spirit appearing to Anna, but she did know the gift was coming, and she did not know, uh, but she did not know when. Maybe she heard what Simeon had said and just followed up, and maybe she simply read the Old Testament prophecies in the Scripture. When she saw Jesus, she gave thanks to God and spoke of how he would be, bring redemption to all Israel. Redemption, as it turns out, is the same word as consolation. It's a wonderful, happy word. What a gift. What a gift giver indeed. Truly the author and finisher of our faith. That's God. And as the scene of the angel talking to the shepherds about this great gift comes to a close, the shepherds are privileged to see an enormous number of angels all at once, praising God. The Greek root word used to describe the gathering is the same from which we derive the English word plethora. Now plethora is a word we sometimes use to just describe something that is overwhelming. Most of the time it would be like if you see roaches in your house. They have a plethora of roaches, okay, or ants. Just unbelievable numbers. All at once, praising God. Their song celebrates God's glory and the peace which the Savior brings to those who believe. But why? 
Why? To reinforce. To stamp approval of what one angel said. Approval. Direct from heaven. The heavenly host, those who simply did nothing but what God had told them. And the rest of the time, praise God. I want you guys to go down there. I want you to back up what the angel just told the shepherds. Let them know this is real. The heavenly host appears to these folks. If one angel scared you, just think what all these folks would have done to you. They knew they had something. They knew something real was going on, okay? The story of the gift of, by one angel might have caused people to think he was working his own story. Not so. God reinforced it by sending the heavenly host. God's plan is a wonderful plan. We had nothing to do with developing this plan, except we were sinful, pitiful creatures. They were, we are today. Most of us in this room are old enough to understand what I'm saying, but we went from a really cute, funny, nice child to a sinful being. Happens to everybody. We fall from Satan's temptations. But God made a way we can overcome that. That's a wonderful plan. Nothing to do with it. Look what it says in Romans 10, 6, 7. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. We get a glimpse of the responsibility that God took on himself for us, okay? What if we had to do this? Gary, is there a uh, fire engine with that ladder that goes real high on buildings? About how high does it go? 100 feet, 10 stories. Gary, do we have buildings in Phoenix that are more than 10 stories? Yes, we do. So you're gonna take a ladder, highest one we know about that Gary can tell us. I'll get to heaven from there. That is one big leap, okay? Well, how about this one? And once you got there, if you made it, your next step is, Jesus, can I talk to you? What? We'd like you to come down to heaven and die on a cross, be resurrected, so we'd have our sins forgiven and come to heaven. That's quite a mission to be on, right? That's what we would have had to do. Or what if we had to figure out a way to walk into the place of rest for the dead and resurrect Christ? He's dead after that cross. What if we had to do that? We don't have to. God did it. It was his plan. Okay? His great love. His gift. And that's what the story is all about. Finally, we return to Luke 2.14. We talked about this heavenly host appearing with the angels, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. And I stopped it right there for, for a reason. Peace. Achievable in our lifetime. You've heard that before. It can be done through God, with God, okay? Romans 5, 9 through 10. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We were God's enemies because of sin. Couldn't get together. Couldn't get together. Because of sin. But the reconciliation occurred. Reconciliation is a big word for we got back together. Whew. How's that for a thoughtful gift? We were God's enemies through our refusal to follow him, our constant flirtation and slavery to sin. But because of the blood of Christ, that gift, we can be reconciled to it. The gift was Christ as an infant, as we have seen, but more importantly, the gift of Christ dying for us as an adult. And it's still our gift to us today. Wonderful thing. The last part of Luke 2.14. Peace to men is where I stopped up before. 
on whom his favor rests. God has peace for those on whom his favor rests. So you're saying, aha. So God looks out and he sees 73 trillion people since the beginning of Adam and Eve, and he chose 100,622? No. No. It's those who please him. It's those who please him. Remember what God said about Jesus when he was baptized? This is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased. Mount of Transfiguration, hear my son. Okay? He was pleased in what Jesus did. Same way he'd be pleased in what we're doing when we come to him. We can be reconciled. For I'm convinced once we're in God, in Jesus, once we've obeyed, once we're a Christian, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. But there's one. I think Paul knew it. But sometimes we read this, we think, I got it made. I don't have to worry about this at all. There is one. It's you. It's me. We're the ones that can separate us from Christ Jesus. Gary can't separate me from Christ Jesus, but Gary can separate himself from him. He can walk away. That's a horrible power to have, but we have it. A terrible thing to execute, but we could if you really wanted to. I wouldn't know why, but you might. So the recommendation, the advice, back from Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. When can the Lord be found? Anytime. We talked this morning about our lives with Jesus. We begin to live as a Christian. And eventually, back in class we discussed this, and eventually we will die in Jesus. At the same time, do others have time to find him? Well, he may be found as in your lifetime. That's it. When you die, can't be found. We have time to turn to Jesus. Call on him while he is near. We're told in scripture, I think it's revelation, that Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And the Greek in that, that knocking is continual and constant. He will not stop. He will not stop knocking on your heart. But he will one day when your life ends. More advice. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. When God speaks, when Jesus speaks, listen. Take it to heart. Live it in your life. Obey it, okay? If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? Jesus came from heaven. God sent him. The warning was there. And the invitation was there to join, to join Jesus through our repentance. Uh, and some other things we'll mention in a minute. He'll forgive us. Don't refuse. Don't refuse. That's what it comes down to. Don't miss God's favor. Don't refuse that gift from heaven. Have you ever refused a gift in your life? Not well, most of us. Oh, thank you for this. Wonderful. Whatever. And yet with Jesus, we, so many of us just, man, don't want that gift. Don't want that gift. Don't miss out on that. So what should I do? Well, I need to hear the gospel. Jesus crucified, died, buried, and then was resurrected on the third day. Paul refers to that in 1 Corinthians 15 as something called of first importance. Jesus doesn't pull that off. Jesus doesn't die and resurrect. We really don't have anything to stand on. We can just go home now. His resurrection is all about, all about God's plan. He has the same plan for us. We need to believe that. We need to recognize we're a sinful creature. 
and repent of those sinful ways. We need to confess your faith before men. Accept that gift of heaven. Jesus, and that's the gift, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the direction received from God. And then live a life of faith showing your gratitude for the gift. The bottom line is this. There's no other way because there's no other gift. There's no other gift. What else you got, God? I got nothing. That's it. My son followed him. And maybe you're not a Christian this morning, and maybe it's time to put on Christ. To put on Christ, to receive salvation, that wonderful gift. Or maybe you walked away a little bit from God, or a lot. And you need the prayers of your brothers and sisters in the church to get back to God, make things right. The good news is God continually accepts and forgives us as long as there's time. Whatever your needs, you come this morning while we stand and sing.